All right, I think it's time to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another exciting afternoon of organic chemistry with your host, me, Dr. White. Notice when I do this, my eyes open up. I don't know why, something psychological. But anyways, today we're gonna have a good time. Uh, first of all, I'll do some lecturing and today's our first lab. And one of the things I didn't do on Monday was talk about the in general labs out, and I'll do that today. We'll do our first lab. Unfortunately, we're not face-to-face -face in uh, ECC. So what I'll be doing is I, I'll talk about it when we go into the lab. Now, a couple of public service announcements from me, the management, and that is first of all, Tomorrow, I will go through the alkanes problem set. I highly recommend that you do them, try some of them before I do. Remember I talked about the first day riding a bicycle and the Blu-ray, watching it is easy until you have to get on the bicycle for the first time. Well, same thing watching me do problems. It's not that hard. But when you have to try it alone at first, well, it's a little challenging, but practice makes perfect. Now, do I go through every problem? No. I'll usually pick a couple on each page, but also, as you've learned, hopefully by now, in my world, in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So, when I'm going through the problem set, I ask for people, are there ones you want me to do? If you have problems with any of the problem sets, problems, Ask and I'll do it. That way you learn. By the way, here's a secret I've learned. If you've got a question about something, a good part of the class has the same question or similar. So ask it. Not only are you helping yourself, but you're helping out a lot of other people too. All right. That's one thing. The other thing, which I haven't mentioned, but eventually it's going to come up. I forgot the exact date in a week or so, maybe a week and a half will be the first test. You're not going to succeed trying to learn organic chemistry the night before a test, or even maybe two nights before a test. Keep up. Do the practice problems. If you're not, and this I'm saying now for the benefit of those who are watching the video, if you're not in class, make sure you keep up with the videos. They're on YouTube. I've already posted yesterday's lecture last night, and usually within 24 hours, I'll have it posted. Uh, one thing I should point out, and that is that um, next week, I'll be start teaching on Tuesday, another class at COD, and I'll be posting those videos. So luckily I have two fast machines, but it's still gonna take time. So when I upload it, and uh, so, but I guarantee within 24 hours or less, any video I take of our class and lecture and the labs will be on YouTube. I do not videotape our office hours I have. By the way, speaking about office hours, tonight from 6 to 7.15 on uh, Zoom, uh, I will have my office hour and it's a different log on than the lecture. And that's because that's the way Zoom works. So it's in the syllabus, and it's also on the first introductory page, a link where you can find the link. Look, we look at my, what should I talk about? No, well, I think I covered everything. Now, on yesterday, we started talking about alkenes and alkynes. Alkenes are carbon-carbon double bond, and alkynes are a triple bond. Now, one of the things I forgot to talk about, bad Dr. White, was as I talked about uh, yesterday and throughout the semester, the fun part of organic chemistry is seeing where it is in our world, in your daily life. And one of the things I forgot of a alkene is the following. There's an alkene that has a common name. Remember, there are two types of names. One is IUPAC, the official, and another one is just a common name everybody's using that's not official. 
that is both are used a lot. In contracts, you usually use IUPAC, same thing with patents. And everybody see limonene on your screen? Thank you. That's uh, something I have to check with Zoom because sometimes it will tell me I'm sharing it and you don't see it. That's a fault in Zoom and I've tried to ask them to correct it. But anyways, limonene is an interesting compound. It has the following structure. Now, if you look at this, you say, hmm, this is the line structure. And in this class, what I'm not doing is other than the ring I put in carbon. So the structure of limonene, if I were to draw it so you could understand it with the carbons, would look like this. Six-membered ring with a double bond. Up here is a methyl group. And a substituent that I haven't talked about, and I really won't in this class, is this. This is called an isopropenol group, which is similar to isopropyl, but it also has a double bond. Now notice limonene has two double bonds. And why am I talking about this? because it's the molecule that you smell from citrus fruits and other things. Limonene has that lemon fresh smell to it. And you usually find it in a lot of the cosmetics and other things, and let me do the following. Everybody see on their screen the different lemon fresh products and when you say, oh, lemon fresh, they squeeze lemons? No, they use limonene. They put it in there and that gives it that lemon fresh smell. And you've been conditioned by marketing sales companies, or we used to call that Madison Avenue, because that's where they were mostly located in New York. I don't know if that's still true or not, that that fresh smell means it's clean. And you've been conditioned to do that. Well, what they just do is put in some limonene. Now, where does most of the limonene come from? It's extracted from the skins of different citrus fruits when they're processed. The skin, outer part, for those who know how to cook, and Dr. White does, it's called the zest, a certain, like lemon zest or lime zest. And they just, when they're processing it, like grapefruits, I think it's the main place, like to make grapefruit juice, the outer skin is the chemical limonene is extracted. And that's got double bonds, so it's an alkene. See, organic chemistry is all around you. Speaking about all around you, did any of you happen to drive by a gas station and think about the gas you buy there, gasoline? Half the weight of that is an alkane, like octane. Do that, it won't hurt. Remember, organic chemistry is all around you. And when you're not in my class, like here on Zoom, you can still think about it, and I promise it won't hurt. By the way, I sold that from SpongeBob. All right, let's get to work. All right, everybody see chapter three on their screen now? Thank you. Now, yesterday I talked about the nomenclature of double bonds. Remember, nomenclature is a fancy word meaning naming. 
and IUPAC nomenclature. IUPAC is the official organization uh, set up by a treaty with the United States and about 129 other countries about 1918 to set up an organization that creates and still is the arbiter of all names of chemicals. And most of those, like the majority, are organic. Now we talked about double bonds, and hold on one second. I get rid of the spell check. Otherwise, you're going to see squiggly lines all over my red lines. Uh, Microsoft Word does not like organic molecules and names unless I put it in the dictionary. But anyways, double bond, remember we did E-N-E ending yesterday. And we also talked about how, notice I say we talked about, I did, you were quite listening. Uh, how you name a double bond, also cis and trans. Now, this chapter deals with alkenes, double bonds, and alkynes, triple bonds. So let's talk about the nomenclature of triple bonds. And let's put one on the screen. All right, from now on, whenever you look at a molecule, look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen atoms. And oh look, three lines between two carbons, like this, this is a triple bond. Which we call an alkyne. And a triple bond, and I'll mention this later on when we get into the chemistry, unlike a double bond, which has one pi bond, two of the three bonds between the carbon, two of them are pi bonds, and one is a sigma bond. And you should know this, but I'll mention this Aren't you glad I'm subtle? And you should know a triple bond has two pi bonds, one sigma bond. Each bond is a pair of electrons. Now, let's go back and look at the triple bond here. Now, a triple bond is three bonds to carbon. So if we look at this carbon right here, it has three bonds from the triple bond, and this bond right here makes it four. Remember, there are always four bonds to carbon. So that's why on both of these carbons here and here, there are no, no hydrogens, because there are always four bonds. There's four bonds to them right now. Now, the other thing, which I will not ask on a test, but the bond angle from this to this is 180 degrees. So alkynes, are straight, linear, and you can't have sister trans like a double bond. So let's look at how do you name an alkene, alkyne. I sometimes get that messed up. I had two more. All right, now, first of all, you find the longest chain with both carbons of the triple bond in the longest chain. Well, there's only one chain, one, two, three, four, five. And hopefully you've learned the table with the alkane names one through 10, five carbons is pentane. Well, for a triple bond, you drop the, oops, getting ahead of myself. You drop the A-N-E ending at the end of pentane and replace it for triple bond, you use Y-N-E. So this would be pentine. 
Now, just like a double bond, you have to show where is the lead carbon of the two carbons of the triple bond. And you always give that the lowest number, the number closest to the end of a chain. In this case, if we start here, we have two. We go the other way. I'm going to go technicolor on you. One, two, three. Which number is smaller? See, the math and organic chemistry is difficult. Two or three? Hopefully, I'll pick two. So this would be two pentine. And that's how you do it. Now, if you have alkyl groups, you can handle them the same way. And let me do this one. Yes, I will share with you. I'm not going to hog all the fun to myself. And the question is, what's the IUPAC name? Remember, IUPAC means the official name. I'll never ask on a test, but I think it's cool to say IUPAC is International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry but that's the official name. And sometime in the future, if you see on your screen or a piece of paper, you print it out, this question, three points each, what do you do? Well, you look at the molecule and say, what's different? What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbohydrate? And you say, oh, look, a triple bond. So how many carbons in the longest chain? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that way. And when we say longest chain, it has to include both carbons of the triple bond. There's one other chain I should consider, and that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So which is larger number? And hopefully I'll pick eight. What do we call eight carbons? Well, hopefully you've learned the table. Hint, if you haven't, this is a good time to start learning it tonight or tomorrow or Friday. Hopefully by Monday, you should have learned it, memorize it. Remember, write the name and say the number of carbons and do that five times. And that will help you memorize it. So eight carbons is octane. But it's a triple bond, and we drop the A-N-E ending at the end of octane, and we use Y-N-E. So it's octine. Now, which carbon is lead carbon of the triple bond? One, two, three. If I go the other way, one, two, three, four, five which is smaller, three or five, and hopefully I'll pick three. So it's three octine. Now, as soon as I say that, that's all spoken for. Oh, look what we have left over. It's your good buddy now, but right now, and hopefully it's your good buddy, the methyl group. And hopefully you've learned the alkyl groups. And therefore, this is methyl. And what carbon is it? Well, if this is three, this has to be four, this has to be five. And therefore, it's five methyl, three octine. Remember, Y in the ending tells you triple bond. And because I'm a nice person, I'm going to share and let you try one. And here's one for you to do. As soon as I fix up this awful looking hydrogen. That looks better. 
what would be the IUPAC name for the following molecule? Three points each. And thank you for everybody for showing up today. Remember, if you want to see me again for this lecture, it's on YouTube once I finish the lecture today and post it later on tonight. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up, either if you got your video on or use your emoji, which I want to rename to Symboli, because it's really a symbol. I think I did it once, but I'm going to have to look up how did they come up with the name emoji? Why not Symboli? Well, anyways, let's do it. I think everybody's done. So how do we, well, I'll give you a couple more seconds. I see someone's still working maybe. And this is why it's important to learn the alkane names, the alpha groups. All right, let's do this. What's different? Triple bond. How many carbons in the longest chain with the triple bond? Both carbons, one, two, three, four, five. Either this one is six or this one is six. Doesn't matter, you'll get the same answer. So the longest chain is six. That's hexane. If it was an alkane, drop the A on the ending, put in hexine, because Y and E is a triple bond ending. And what's the lead carbon? Well, this one's simple. It's one. As you go the other way, it would be six. Now, are we done? As soon as we say one hexine, that's spoken for. And look what we have here, our old friend, the methyl group. What carbon is it on? Carbon number five says five methyl, one hexine. Now, important thing students always ask me is, on a test, do I have to number these like this and circle things? And the answer is no. All you have to do is write the name. But the reason I do that is so you can see how the name is developed or created. Let's do another one. These are fun. And remember, it's now your solemn responsibility to make sure I don't make a mistake when I'm putting in the hydrogens like this. And the question is, what's the IUPAC name for the following molecule? Three points each. While you're doing that earlier today, before a class, one of your colleagues asked a good question. And that is, do I have our Zoom meetings Monday through Thursday, every day of the week? And the answer is yes. And the reason I was doing that is I made a conscious decision. I'm gonna teach this like a VCM class, even though it is an internet. And I can, how can I do that? Because I'm putting everything on YouTube. And I'd hope you watch that or come to class. You don't have to, but if you want to get a good grade, and, and wink, wink, say no more, I'd watch my lectures. All right, anybody need more time? Going once, going twice, nobody's screaming at me. So I'm going to get to work. Look at a molecule, look for what's different. What's well, not a carbon, carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen gets you get your attention. And lo and behold, there's a triple bond, alkyne. How many carbons in the longest chain with both carbons in a triple bond? 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine across. One, two, three, four, five, six. Or I could have gone one, two, three, four, five down to here, six. Now you don't count this right here coming to here from the end down here because that doesn't contain all the car both carbons in the triple bond. So the longest chain is nine. And an alkane nine, oops, wrong color. Is no name. Drop the A on the ending and put in no nine because Y and E is a triple bond. Now, what's the carbon closest of the two carbons of the triple bond closest to the end of the chain? And that's right here, one, two. We do it the other way, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is on carbon seven. If I went this way numbering and call this one, which I won't, and because two is less than seven. So it's 209. As soon as I say that, this is all spoken for. Oh, look, we have not one, but two alkyl groups. CH3 knows methyl, and hopefully you'll learn soon, like by Monday, I highly recommend that CH2, CH3 is an ethyl group. Now, I won't hold you to the alphabetical order rule but I will hold myself to it. So we have ethyl and methyl. If you have these reversed, that's okay. Don't tell anybody I said that because they'll think I'm, I don't want to ruin my image around here and people think I'm nice. Now, what carbons are the ethyl and methyl on? Well, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five. So it's four ethyl, Five methyl, two no nine. Now, if you had written down five methyl, four ethyl, two no nine, I'd give you full credit. Just don't tell the IUPAC, please, I did that, because I'm not going to hold you to the alphabetical rule. And that's how you do triple bonds in terms of here's the molecule, draw the structure. Now, good news, unlike double bonds, you got to get the really, I mean, really large ring to have a triple bond in it. And in my professional and even academic career, I have never encountered a triple bond in a ring. I think long ago in a paper I saw where somebody had a triple bond and a huge ring, and a bunch of us who were who, chemists who saw that paper and said, all right, that's interesting. What good is it? Other than the person had bragging rights. Oh, look what I can do. Which sometimes you see that in publications in organic chemistry. And anyways, in my class, we will not deal with a triple bond in a ring. Now, there are two types of nomenclature skills you should have, which means there's two types of nomenclature questions I can ask on a test. One is, here is the structure, draw, give, uh, write the IUPAC name. And the other is, here's the name, draw the structure. Oh, I think I mentioned this, but in case you forgot, if you can't read my handwriting, ask, if you have trouble with cursive, send me an email or talk to me privately. Just tell me about that and I'll stay with writing. My first grade teacher would be very happy to see I'm not writing that badly.
So the question is, draw the structure for two heptide. How do you do this? How do you decode it? Well, you start in all organic molecules, you start from the right, move left. Why any ending? Means triple bond. If that were A and E, heptane, seven carbons. I have my seven carbons. Where's the lead carbon of the triple bond? Carbon number two. So if I start here, here's two. I'll draw on my triple bond. Now I have to put in the hydrants, but I know there's four bonds to carbon. Hold on, I have to do this full screen because something you should always remember. Everybody, how many bonds to carbon? Four. Does this look like it's coming right at you? If I were in a classroom, I'd say, look, doesn't it seem like I'm in 3D and you don't even have to wear those glasses? Yes, I have bad humor in a classroom too. So I can immediately put in my hydrogen. So here's one bond, four minus one is three, four here, four here, so I don't have to put any hydrogen. And that's how you do it. And if you had alkyl groups, you know how to do that. So let me have you try one first. And that's three decine. Why don't you draw the structure of three decine? You're doing organic chemistry and it's not that painful, I hope. And any of you have either children or colleagues around, they can sit in too and I won't charge extra. All right, if you're done, give me a thumbs up. I see everybody's giving me a thumbs up, so I better get to work. How do you decode this? You start from the right and move left. Why any ending? Triple bond, alkyne. If this were A, I need decane, 10 carbons, so I better get to work. And where is the triple bond carbon number three? One, two, three. Have my triple bond now put in the hydrogen. Now you could have started counting this way and put the triple bond there, and that would have been perfectly correct. But most of you are probably used to starting from the left, counting to the right, just like how you read, unless you know Hebrew or other languages that go the other way. Oh, let's do another one. These are fun. And why don't you try this one for isopropyl 209. When you're done, give me a thumbs up. 
we were in a classroom, I could just look around, see when everybody's done, but I can't on Zoom. I assume everybody's done. So let's do this. How do you decode this to know what it is? You start from the right and move left. Why on the ending? Triple bond. And if that were A and E, no name, that's nine carbons. So I better get to work. And here we have our nine carbons. Where's the triple bond? Remember Y and E, triple bond. It's carbon two, one, two, triple bond. If this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. On carbon four, as we're going this way, it's an isopropyl group, three carbons. And the center carbon is bonded to the chain in this case. And now I know there are four bonds to carbon and I can put in the rest of my hydrogens. And there you go, that's how you do it. And that's, the, oh, there's one more. Now, on a test, I will never ask you what's the common name for a structure, but I will ask you, draw the structure. Of the following common name, and this is a settling. What is the structure of settling? Acetylene is the simplest alkyne to carbons. And that's the structure. And you could also draw it this way. This is called the right uh, left justified hydrogen that only occurs on the carbon on the left at the very end. You can do that. And that's how you do this. And acetylene as I think I mentioned the other day, is mixed with oxygen to make a super hot flame that's used in metal working and body shops and cars and other things where you need, like it got to break into a bank vault. At least that's how it is on the movies. Trust me, I've never tried it. I have worked with acetylene torches in a lab once long ago, and they're quite hot. All right. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, I'll mention it again, nomenclature is very important in organic chemistry. That's how we communicate the structure of molecules. But doing nomenclature, especially to synthetic organic chemists, which I am, by the way, synthetic means my training has been making molecules. It's a fancy way to say, I'm an ch organic chemist who makes molecules, and I have. And it's about as exciting nomenclature as going into a very fancy restaurant and ordering plain white toast. They'll keep you alive, but there's so many better things on the menu. So now it's time for the best part of organic chemistry. That's doing reactions to make things. But don't forget I'm biased, I'm a synthetic organic chemist. I'm skipping slides we've already covered. And now it's time for some chemistry, some reactions. And the first reaction we're going to deal with is called an addition reaction. An addition reaction and hopefully you all see that on your screen, is when you add something to a molecule. Now, where it says alkenes undergo addition reactions where pi bond is broken and two new sigma bonds, single bonds are formed, I'll never ask you what is an addition reaction on a chemical on a test of mine. Now, one thing my software does this 
there'd be a carbon here and a carbon here. Now, something I need to teach you right off the bat, because I'll use it a lot this semester. And that's what's R. Now, how many of you are familiar with in math, x plus y equals 10? What's x, what's y? They're called variables. And I could say if x is two, y would be eight. Or if x is five, y is five. They're, they're, all they mean is x and y are numbers. Well, in organic chemistry, R is our variable. How do they pick R? I spent one afternoon trying to find out. The best I can guess is, if you look at the periodic table, no element has the chemical symbol R for its name. So it's free to use. And R is a value variable in organic chemistry, which means they're carbon and hydrogens here going from this carbon to R. R contains carbon hydrogens. How many? As many as you want. One, two, five, a thousand, a million, whatever. Now, I didn't do it here and I should have done it. There are different ways of showing different R groups. It's like math, you can use X, Y, and Z and other variables. Well, in organic chemistry, one way, which I'll do in here, is R and R prime. And that means R and R prime can be different or the same, just like X and Y can be different. And you can also have R double primes, like you have Z and triple prime I've used on uh, four two. Also, in, if you're doing a lot of R groups, you tend to then use subscript numbers. But for this class, I don't have to do that. All right, so what are we gonna talk about? The first chemical reaction. Double bond. The most important thing is the two bonds between the two carbons of double bond. And you should know there's one pi bond and there's one sigma bond. Pi bonds, you can break like that. Easy, fast, and fun. Sigma bonds, you don't break other than combustion in this class. There's another one reaction or you can break a sigma bond, but I'm not gonna teach that in this class. If you have something in the form AB, you break the pi bond and one carbon gets A, the other gets B. And that's called an addition reaction. And there are a number of them I'm gonna teach you today. Let's go through the first addition reaction. Oh, by the way, I'll mention this a lot because it's important. In this class, carbon-carbon single bonds, otherwise known as sigma bonds, and also carbon-hydrogen iron, well, they're somewhat, but carbon-carbon single bonds are almost never broken except in combustion. I used to teach the reaction of double bonds with ozone, but I don't anymore. I should have taken that out. That's the only exception. All right. Dr. White's very happy because it's time for our first real reaction. Now we're getting, getting into the real fun part of organic chemistry. And the first one is hydrogenation. Now, I will never ask on a test or the final, what's the name of a reaction? But I will use them because that's how we talk about them. And the first one I want to talk about is hydrogenation. And that's addition of hydrogen gas H2, I should have put gas here, to an alkene, a double bond. Now, in order to make it go quicker, you need a catalyst. And the catalysts are platinum, palladium, or nickel. If you work in industry like I have, you use nickel. If you work in a pharmaceutical or cosmetic, you can get away with the higher price, platinum and palladium. And what is a catalyst? It's something that makes a reaction go quicker. And time is money. Do you want to wait four or five weeks for a reaction to happen? Or do you want it done in four hours? I like it done in four hours. And that's why we use a catalyst. So what's the hydrogenation? You take a double bond, and really a better way of writing it is this. Any double bond, reacted with hydrogen 
and a catalyst, and the catalyst can be platinum, palladium, or nickel. You break the pi bond. You don't break the sigma bond. It's still there. And each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. And that's called hydrogenation. Now, there's one thing I should point out that organic chemists do that I did without even thinking on that slide. Notice the general chemical reaction here, A plus B goes to C. The base of the arrow, these are the reactants, which I will more likely, because I work in industry, have most of my life. We call those the starting materials. And at the head of the arrow, right there to C, that's called a product. Or if there's more than one product. Now, this is one way of writing a chemical reaction. Another way organic chemists do, and I don't know how it started, but <laughs> I learned this, I do it, and I'll be teaching it this way. We can also do this. A, and then you put the second reactant or starting material over the arrow, plus B makes C. And sometimes you'll put stuff also under the arrow. How that got started, I don't know, but it's heavily used. And guess what? I use it. So we have this general reaction. Any double bond in a molecule, and this is the beauty, uh, you're now learning functional group chemistry, organic chemistry. The functional group is the double bond. Anytime you have a double bond molecule and react it with hydrogen the catalyst, where the catalyst is either nickel, platinum, or palladium, you'll break the double bond. Remember, there's a pi bond here you break. The sigma bond, single bond, you don't and each carbon gets a hydrogen. Now, I won't do this all the time, but the general reaction is your roadmap. And if you don't know the roadmap, you're not gonna get, like I said yesterday, the right city, you're not gonna get to the right answer. Now, on a, in real life and on a test, for this type of product, And the question is, give the organic product or products for the following. And the question is, what do I do? Here's what you do. First of all, you look at a molecule and say, what's different? And here I see a double bond. And when I see that, I ignore everything else because that's where the fun's gonna happen. And I'm reacting with hydrogen, gas, H2, and what's platinum, a catalyst. Remember the catalysts for this reaction are platinum, palladium, or nickel. And you break the pi bond and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. You break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. So you have three carbons here, you better end up with three carbons in your product. Each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. And notice I broke the pi bond, and now I'll put in the hydrogens. Now you could write it like this, or if you want, you can either also write it like this. 
where I'm bringing in the hydrogens up to the carbon. I'd recommend you do it this way. That's one less step you have to do in your brain. And did I tell you I'm this close to the person grading the test? Me. And that's how you do it. Now, if I look at the clock, it's time to take our five minute break. We'll come back in five minutes. I'm gonna do my stretching and I'll see you in five.
time to come back. All right, is everybody back? Yes, you are. All right, so we were talking about hydrogenation. That's where you add hydrogen, the catalyst, to a double bond, any molecule with a double bond. And the beauty of learning these general reactions is whenever you have any molecule with a double bond in it, and you add hydrogen catalyst, this is what's going to happen. And let's do another one. And then I'll let you try one. And the question is, give the organic product or products for the following. And how do you do that? You look at a molecule and look for what's different. You're gonna have nightmares hearing me say that, but when I look at any molecule, I look for all the functional groups and the way to find a functional group in a molecule is that's where all the action happens is what's different, what's not a carbon-carbon single bond, what's not carbon or hydrogen atoms. And lo and behold, a double bond. When I look at that molecule, that double bond is looking at me and like flashing red lights at a train crossing gets my attention quick. So what I really have here is a double bond. What am I reacting with? Hydrogen, what's nickel? A catalyst, remember the catalyst is nickel, platinum, or palladium. In this case, it's nickel. And you break the pi bond, which I've done. Remember, double bond has one pi bond and one sigma bond. And each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Well, if I look at my molecule I have up here, I have four carbons across plus two methyls. I better end up with that, or you're going to get the wrong answer. Now, here are my two carbons of double bond, these two carbons. I broke the pi bond. Each one gets a hydrogen. I'll do that now. And I know there are four bonds to carbon. I should turn on my camera. I forgot to. There I am. And now I know I can put in the rest of the hydrogen. And you could have written this as CH3 instead of the way I did, but that's easier for you. And that's how you do hydrogenation. So, whoop. It's your turn. Have fun with your first organic chemical reaction. Give the organic products three points each. And have fun. When you're done, give me a thumbs up. I see a couple of people are done. For those who are quicker than others, please be patient. Everybody done? 
Hi, I think everybody's done, so let me get to work. When I look at this compound right here, I look for what's different, what's not a carbon carbon single bond, carbon and hydrogen, and lo and behold, a double bond. What am I reacting with? Hydrogen. And what's palladium? It's a catalyst, which we abbreviate by cat. And the catalyst can be palladium, platinum, or nickel. And what happens, you break the pi bond, Remember, there's one pi bond, one sigma bond, and each carbon gets a hydrogen. Well, do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No. Let me emphasize that. Remember, in this class, do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No, you don't. Don't. When I first started teaching, students were doing that, and their grades were eh. I think everybody knows what at really bad. And I said, how do I get them to stop doing crazy things on a test? I came up with, do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. All of a sudden the grades went way up again, or went up, which made me happy and also the students. So you don't break carbon, carbon single bonds. So I have one, two, three, four, five across carbons. I better end up with five carbons. If not, you've done it wrong. Here are my two carbons of the double bond. I've broken the pi bond. Each carbon gets a hydrogen. Now I know there are four bonds to carbon and I can fill in the rest. And that's how you do it. Oh, this was fun. We got to do another one. And there you go. There's one for you to have some fun. Question is, give the organic product or products for the following. Three points each. And when we are done, oh, I know what I can do. I'll wait a little while. Isn't it nice that I share the fun? <laughs> if I say fun enough, you'll believe me. So, some classes like me doing this, some don't. All right, anybody need more time? In that case, let's do it. Now, how do you do this reaction? How do you find out what is the product or products? You look at the molecule for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen? Oh, a double bond. Gets my attention like that. And what am I reacting the double bond with? Hydrogen. And nickel is a catalyst. Remember, the catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. In this case, it's nickel. And you break the pi bond. Remember, trip, double bond, one pi bond, one sigma bond. And each carbon gets a hydrogen. Do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No. So notice I have one, two, three, four, five across, plus things don't move around. 
On this carbon, I have two methyl groups, CH3. On this carbon, I have a methyl group. Here are my two carbons of the double bond. I've broken the pi bond, and each one gets a hydrogen. And now I can fill in the rest of the hydrogens because so I know there's four bonds to carbon. And that's the answer. Now, what I just did on that problem was the chemistry instructor's favorite trick on a test. That is, I put a big scary molecule on there. Because if you don't know what you're doing, that's a big scary molecule. But you know how to look for the functional group, functional group alkene double bond, then as soon as you see there's only a double bond and nothing else are just carbon, carbon, single bonds, nothing else is gonna happen with this reagent. Therefore, what happens with double bond? You break the pi bond, each carbon gets a hydrogen and you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds, you redraw the structure without the pi bond, each carbon gets a hydrogen, you're done. And that's where it helps knowing the general reaction. How do you write, learn that? You write double bond, hydrogen catalyst, break the pi bond, you write the two carbons with each one of hydrogen, and underneath what the catalyst is, platinum, palladium, or nickel, and you do that five times. And you say it out loud, unless you're in a library or a firehouse, you don't want to scare people, and you can say it silently in your mind. And I don't know why, but that always worked for me as a student, and it's worked for my students over the years in organic chemistry. And for most students, not all, but most, it's much, much more effective than flashcards. How many of you are familiar where you make up the flashcards and just keep on looking at them over? This way it's more active in your brain. I'm a chemist, not a psychologist, but it works good. All right, a couple of things. Hydrogenation. How many of you have ever heard of hydrogenated fats and oil? And you've heard those aren't good for you. Well, what's hydrogenated fats and oils? That's a fat or an oil with a double bond in it, and they add hydrogen to catalyst to it. And you get a single bond afterward, which is what I just showed you. Later this semester, when we talk about fats and oils, I'll go into detail what happens, what actually in the molecule of the fat and oil, what you get, and why you do that. Now, I should tell you, having worked for many decades in the chemical industry. At my first job, when I was first a bench chemist, and then within two years, I was the manager of that research group. I knew what I was doing, and I got promoted real quick. Uh, but anyways, my first project in industry was hydrogenation. And later on, another company worked with hydrogenation. So it's a reaction. I know quite well. Now, something I won't put on a test, but I do want to teach you about this quickly is, how many of you have ever seen the vehicles that deliver gasoline to gas stations? Those tall vehicles, long vehicles, they're also somewhat tall. Hold on, let me get over to here. And they're showing tank. All right, everybody see on the screen right here, this one with the red uh, cab truck on it, tank wagon, can you see that? That is a tank wagon. And here they have another one down here, a tank wagon. Except for this one for oil, the gasoline and other things like where they have milk are standardized. Those are 5,000 gallons, 40,000 pounds. And I have personally managed the reaction of the plant 
where you use one of those whole with chemicals, not gasoline, to do hydrogenation. And by the way, it's really a lot of fun when you're dealing with 40,000 pounds of chemicals. It's big time. It also can be very dangerous. I'll tell that story another day where you, you get religion real quick because you're about seconds away of being killed. But anyways, I've done hydrogenations on 40,000 pound batches of chemicals. I'll talk more about that throughout the semester. But this stuff is done every day in the United States, hydrogenations throughout the world too. Because I work for an international company that was just headquartered out of the Netherlands. So this is your first general reaction. I highly recommend before test number one, that you learn it because I do not do open note, open book test. And even though I'll, you'll be taking your test at home, I put secret things in there. No students are cheating. So please don't. All right. Now, the first addition reaction I taught you was hydrogenation. Let's look at another addition reaction. That's called halogenation. Halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now, in organic chemistry, halogen is abbreviated by the letter X. How that came about, I don't know. Somebody decided to do that. None of the elements have just the letter X as their chemical symbol. And once again, here I remember to put the R prime. Remember, R is just like X and Y in math. If you add halogen to a double bond, and the X can be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, and let me write it a better way. Remember, double bond has one pi bar and one sigma bar. And pi bonds, you can break like that real quick. And in fact, not this week, but next week we'll do a lab and you'll see how quickly it can be broken. And you break the pi bond and like hydrogenation, you break the pi bond and each carbon of the double bond gets something. Now it gets a halogen. And this is hal halogenation. And it's an important reaction. Why? Because Making these things allows chemists to make molecules that are used in our daily life for many things or to make other things. Think of the general reactions as you learning how to do things like a uh, carpenter would, learning how to work with a two by four, one by two, or nails, screws, and all that to build things like what? A house. Well, that's what these general reactions do. So this is halogenation. Let's have some fun with halogenation. Now, And the question would be, give the organic product or products for the following reaction. And once again, you look at a molecule, what's different? A double bond. What is this? Remember the halogens. X are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. I'm assuming all of you know those are the chemical symbols for the halogens, second to last column on the right on the periodic table. So what we really have here is this, where X can be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And you break the pi bond. Remember, a double bond has one pi bond, one sigma bond. You don't break the sigma bond, pi bonds you break and they're fun to break. And each carbon gets a halogen. Now, do you break carbon, carbon, single bond? And the answer is no. So I have 
three carbons here, I better end up with three carbons. Here are my two carbons that double bond, these two carbons, and I break the pi bond, and each one gets a halogen. In this case, what's X? Bromine. And I put in the hydrogen. A bromine counts as one bond. And that's how you do it. Now, one of the questions you should ask is, why do you do this? Well, until about four years ago, and for a certain case, it's still true. And one of you, your ears are going to perk up right now. Uh, making halogenated compounds, putting halogens in an organic molecule, allowed you to make fire retardants. And halogenated fire retardants are very important. They're one of the type of chemicals that help keep children's clothes from burning. Nothing can be made fireproof that could burn on its own, nothing. You can heat it up high enough, eventually it will burn, but you can retard it so you can save like a child. Now about four or five years ago, four very, um, what would be the right word, creative or industrious reporters from the Chicago Tribune looked into fire retardants for things like furniture or your plastic, like in your computer monitor and everything, and found out that it was all traced back to this one article by the Swedish research chemist. And he never really implied that these were that good. And it turns out they aren't that as good as claimed. And a lot of the fire retardants in certain applications really don't work that well, but companies keep on claiming that to make money. Sad but true. Another thing I should mention, there's good parts of organic chemistry and not so good parts. And when you have a lot of halogens in a molecule, that makes it a very good carcinogen. So not only these molecules were put on your furniture and your plastic, but getting into the air could cause you cancer, which is unfortunate. That I don't know if they still do that or not. I haven't followed up. All right. But like I said, I'm going to be talking about real life and the good things happen, not so good things. And it's your turn. Give the organic product or products you're following. All right, give me a thumbs up when you're done. See a couple of you are done already. All right, I think everybody's done. So let's do this. All right. The drill is the same. Look at a molecule, look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon and hydrogen should get your attention. Oh, a double bond. And immediately that's the only thing in that molecule that got my attention. And we have I2 as a halogen, which we abbreviate with X. And here, remember, just to remind you, X can be fluorine, chlorine, bromine or iodine, and you break the pi bond. Remember, double bond has one pi bond, one sigma bond, single bond. You don't break single bonds, but you break pi bonds. And each carbon of the double bond gets a halogen. Now here, you break carbon, carbon, single bonds. No, so you have one, two, three, four, five across. You better end up with five across. 
Oops, sorry about that. And which two carbons are the double bond carbons? These two, which correspond to these two. I have broken the pi bond. Each one gets a halogen. In this case, the halogen is iodine. And now put in the hydrogen. And that's how you do it. Now, one of the things I just realized I forgot to talk about in hydrogenation, and I'll do it now, what happens if you have this reaction? And, oh, we have a ring. But these are just carbon-carbon single bond, but we have a double bond and double bond hydrogen catalyst, catalyst, <clears throat> excuse me, equals can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And we break the pi bond and each carbon gets a hydrogen. Now in a ring, you don't show hydrogens. And the answer would be this, I'm done. Now, if we look at these two carbons in double bond, there are three bonds to each. That means there's one hydrogen on each. We look at the ring here, those same carbons, there are two bonds to each. Therefore, four minus two, there would be two hydrogens. So each one got another hydrogen. And that's how you do a ring. Sorry about that, but I forgot. Now let's do this one. And have fun. Kent, look right up here, X2. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. And so if you want, you can use the other emojis too. Have fun with it. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do this. Now, if we look at this molecule, what's different? Ooh, a double bond. The rest of the ring, even though it's a ring, are only carbon-carbon single bonds. And they don't react that much, except when you burn them. And here we have a double bond. What's chlorine? Cl2 gas. It's a halogen. And the general reaction is double bond plus halogen gas, where X can be fluorine, chlorine, oops. Let's try that again. Bromine or iodine. And what do you do? You break the pi bond, but not the sigma bond. And each carbon of the double bond gets a halogen. Well, we've got this ring here. Do we break the carbon-carbon single bonds? No. We still have a ring. Before I started teaching that, students would always want to break that ring bonds. And uh, this is the carbon. This is a single bond. These are the two carbons. Hold on. There are my two carbons right here. I broke the pi bond. And each one gets a halogen, in this case, chlorine. And I'm done. That's how you do it.
Oh, let's do one more. And there you go, have fun. Give the organic product or products for a following. Remember, these are ways of making new molecules that we use to make other new molecules that you use in your daily life or use these actual new molecules. All right, if you're done, give me a thumbs up. I think everybody's done. So let's do this reaction. We look at the uh, starting material here. What's different? A double bond. We got a ring, but a ring, the rest of it is carbon, carbon, single bond. And what do we have here? Fluorine, which is a halogen. Remember, X can be, in this case, it is fluorine or chlorine, bromine or iodine. And I'm going to break the pi bond, and each carbon of the double bond gets a halogen. Well, do you break carbon carbon single bonds? No. So I'm going to have my ring. I'm going to still have my two methyl groups, CH3 here, CH3 here which are my two carbons in double bond, these two carbons, and each one gets a halogen. What's my halogen? Fluorine. And that's how you do the reaction. And you get this difluoro compound, which you can use for other things. One of the things fluorinated compounds have been found to be good flame retardants also, plus, certain fluorinated compounds I'll talk about later are used in certain polymers. Now, if you notice this reaction I just wrote, the methyl groups and the other carbons in the ring just come along for the ride and they stay there. And that's halogenation, another addition reaction. All right, let's talk about today on Monday and Wednesdays are what we, I will call lab days. Now, if we were at ECC face-to-face, -face, on Monday and Wednesdays, I'd do just 50 minutes lecture. We'd take a 10-minute break, and then we'd have our lab. And the lab is allocated for an hour and 50 minutes, but most students would get out a little earlier. Now, today and next couple of days, I'm gonna cheat and take some time out. First of all, you're not gonna actually be working in the lab. Uh, <laughs> We can't have you go out and buy chemicals and do organic chemistry at home. That would be extremely dangerous. <laughs> and uh, how should I say that it's extremely dangerous? And I'll leave it at that. So a couple things. First of all, when we were doing face-to-face, -face, when I inherited Chem 170, and I'm the only one who teaches it at Elgin Community College, uh, first of all, it's only an hour and 50 minutes per lap. At all other schools, it's two hours and 50 minutes. So what that meant is I couldn't use lab books that are you buy because those labs are over two hours. And if it's an hour and 50 minutes I have with a student, I can't ask them to spend an extra 10 minutes when we were face to face because they might have another class to go to. So being an organic chemist plus who's worked many decades in the chemical industry, I challenged myself successfully to write all new labs for Chem 170 years ago, which I still use and will be using, but I'll be providing you the data instead of you going to lab. Sad, but I think it's safer instead of going to ECC with COVID-19 uh, floating around. Now it's getting better, but uh, a year ago it wasn't better. 
And so that's how I got around it. So what we're going to do now is I've ended the lecture. We're not going to take a break. I'm going to let you out. We'll get out early on Monday and Wednesdays. But for now, next couple, because of July 5th, I'm going to lose a whole day of lecture because of the holiday long weekend. I'm going to sneak in some time on Monday and Wednesdays so we don't fall behind or I have to rush. All right, let's talk about lab. In the lab, let me open up the syllabus. Give me a second. All right, nope, I haven't gotten it on. Everybody see the syllabus on the screen now, lab syllabus? All right, now this is, you can download from D2L. And for this class this summer, all labs will be in a Zoom meeting and I'll be providing handouts. Those handouts are in the assignment area of G2L for you to download. Now, you don't have to buy a manual. And even for your face to face, I saved you. That's about $100 right there or more. Because uh, I'll be handing them out. You can download them. They're both Word and PDF files. Now, I have here students are expected to attend all labs or watch them on YouTube video for the labs. I'll be explaining what you're going to do so you can understand how to do it and learn. Now, you're supposed to hand in the labs for evaluation. Now, the final lab is, uh, your final lab grade is worth, I think, 19%, or I might be a little off here. And here, I made a mistake. I should have caught this, and I'll have to go back and correct it probably this weekend. It's really 11 points. And each lab is 11 points. I think we got 12 out of 13 or 13 out of 14. I'll have to go. And your lab report is due the next session, lab section after the session for the lab report being handed in. So today's lab, our next lab will be Monday. Labs will be Monday and Wednesday. And this is a, the due date is in the assignment area of Blackboard. So today's lab will be due next uh, Monday. Now lab reports are due if you get zero points, if you don't hand in a lab, if it's late more than two days, uh, up to two days or eight days, you get two points taken off. And if it's more than eight days late, you get zero points. In other words, get them in on time. The lab reports are simple, takes no more than 15, 20 minutes to do it at that long. Uh, worst case scenario will be a half hour. The reason why I'm going to be teaching, I'm teaching this class, and then also at College of the Page, I'll teach a class at COD. And each week, are you ready for this? I'm going to have about 86 labs to grade. Each lab, 24 plus 18 or something like that. Uh, about 42, 45 labs, each lab times two a week. I can't have students handing them in two weeks later. Uh, I tried something like that this last term, where it was just a smaller number per week, and it was a nightmare, and that's not going to happen again. When we're face to face, I expect to hand in the next lab. And that way, I don't get, makes my life easier, and it's also better for you. All right. Now, the various lab schedule, here I have safety on Monday uh, or not, because we're not going to be actually in the lab. Today is going to be melting point. Uh, next Monday will be alkanes, alkenes, then electrophilic substitution, 
than aromatic spices, alcohols, and so on. So what does that mean? It means I have to open up a lab. All right, I copy. Hold on, I'll be with you in a second. In a way, I'm glad this happened, not really, but. All right, if you notice I'm in D2L, and if we go to Simon area, click on top, you'll see various assignments. Don't forget to do your signature sheet. And if we do melting points, oh, I'm in. you'll see there are a couple downloads. One of the things I provided was both as a PDF and a uh, Word document. If you do not have a scanner at home, which I have too, but in case you don't, I have instructions how you can use your cell phone. I think everybody has either their own or access to a cell phone that has a camera on there, how to take pictures of whatever you write out, and then you can publish, it explains how you can create a PDF file from that, and then you upload it to the assignment area, and that you, for this lab, you'll have to by Monday afternoon. Now, the labs are right here. Let me open one up. This is the lab I'm gonna be teaching you right now. All right, everybody see melting points on your screen right now. This is today's lab. Now, one thing, if you do not have a printer or if your printer died, mine did the end of last year, took me a couple of weeks or two before I replaced it. You don't have a printer. All you have to do is and write out, and it'll be the same thing for the test, your answers on a piece of paper, and then take a picture if you don't have a scanner, and create a PDF file, and that's what you end up with. All right, let's talk about today's lab. And today's lab deals with melting points. I think you've all seen ice cubes go from a solid to liquid, and that's called melting. Melting is when a solid becomes a liquid. Now, the melting point is the temperature at which that happens. Now for inorganic things, it's very sharp. For organic molecules, it's wider. And let me explain on the whiteboard. And if you have a melting point, 
In organic chemistry, we measure two things, the start and the finish. And that's temperature. The start is when you see any liquid. And I should mention anything we do in the lab, I will never put on an hour exam. I keep them separate. And the first temperature and the melting point of organic is when you see any liquid form. And the finish is all your sample is liquid. So if I had compound Z, and I did a melting point, you may see something like 100 to 102 degrees C. And that's the melting point. And that's where you get this range. 100 is when I, in the sample, I'd be heating it and watching it. I see any liquid form, I record the temperature. Then when all my sample that I'm measuring is liquid, I would get the second temperature, 102. And that would be the melting point for compound C. Now, The question is, why do you, why do chemists take melting points? Now, it turns out the melting point of a pure uh, compound is a physical constant. And many organic compounds, these melting points have been determined. And you use melting points to determine the identity of an unknown compound, or another reason is to determine the purity of an organic compound. Now, again, there are two reasons a chemist takes a melting point. One is to determine the identity of an unknown compound, and the other is to determine the purity of it. Now, for identity, you can do a melting point, and it's gonna have a range and you can find out from tables now online, all right, my compound has a melting point 100 to 102 and it could be these compounds. Now, how does it do purity? Let's talk about something hopefully you learned in uh, general chemistry and that's called the colligative effect. And the colligative effect is when you mix two things together, two different compounds, solids, and later on you can do liquids, but let's talk about solids, something interesting happens. Even if they have the identical melting point, the mixture has a lower melting point than individual compounds and wider. So colligative effect is you have a mixture of two different compounds. The melting point of the mixture is going to be lower than the individual ones, and it's going to be wider. And that happens. We actually use that effect in things, and I'll teach you later on, like your antifreeze or putting salt on a road to melt the ice when it's below the freezing point of water. But the colligative effect, when you have two compounds that are different, even if they have the same melting point, you get a lower and wider uh, melting point. Now, you can use this property to determine purity and also unknown. If you have a pure product when you make something, it should have the exact melting point that's listed in the literature. If you have a impure compound, it has something else in there. Therefore, when you do the melting point, 
will be lower and wider. Now you can use that to identify, to help identify a compound. If I have compound A, and I think it's this compound, say, I don't know, uh, compound Z. And I don't know A is really Z. I'll take the melting point of the A, and I'll know the melting point of Z, and I'll mix them together. If they stay the same, then they're the same compound. If they're different, they go lower. Again, if you have an unknown and a known, and you mix them together, and the melting point of the unknown and the mixture are the same, then they're the same compound. If they're different because of the colligative effect, they'll go down. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to do this in the lab, but the thing I see about labs or just science in general, especially organic chemistry, is I might be lying to you. I'm not, but I could. And you go in the lab and prove these things. Now, there's a YouTube video here. Let's watch it. Try online work and project calendars. Unlike traditional calendars, right calendars are directly connected to projects and tasks. Does everybody see the YouTube on there? Video? One of the physical properties of a pure organic solid is its melting point. And we're going to demonstrate how we take a melting point. The apparatus that we're going to use is called a melt tent. Now this is an older version of the melt tent and it's constructed with a variac and a heated aluminum block, which has a place for a thermometer, the samples and a magnifying glass to see what happens as the solid starts to melt. There's also a lamp here, which illuminates the sample. Now there's a newer version of the melt tent. And the only difference between it and the older version is this shield, because the uh, aluminum block gets very, very hot, and so does the lamp. And so in order to avoid getting burned, the manufacturer has constructed this shield around the place where the melting point actually occurs, but we're not going to use this one. Although we do have it in the laboratory, we're going to use the older version. At ECC, we have the older version. The first thing we have to do is to get a sample. The sample that I'm going to take a melting point of is the compound fluorinone. Now fluorinone is a naturally yellow material. And we chose this so that we could see when the melting uh, point phenomenon actually occurs in the sample tube, which we're going to take the melting point in. What we do is we fill up a uh, a glass tube which is sealed at only one end. And it has an open end as well. And that's how we're going to get the compound. And the way we do this is to take the solid, take the open end of the melting point capillary and poke it in there a few times to get about maybe five to 10 millimeters length of solid in the tube. A very small sample you need. Observe the solid in the tube. 
Now the trick is to get that solid from the open end to the closed end. And the way we do that is to simply tap, tap the solid down by hitting the closed end against a against the, the desktop. The solid is now down at the closed end. All right, we're ready to take the melting point now. Plug in our apparatus. And you can tell that the instrument is working because when you uh, turn this on, the, the light goes on in there. Okay. We're going to use the thermometer that's supplied with your kit of equipment. And it's going to go into the thermometer section of the heated aluminum block. Now we have to remember that the thermometer fits very, very tightly into the aluminum block. If there is any amount of catch that this thermometer experiences as you push it down in there, do not use it. Withdraw it immediately because this thermometer will get stuck in there and you'll never get it out, believe me. Now we also want to put into the aluminum block where the sample is being held, right there. There are two diagrams in your laboratory manual, which I want you to pay attention to, concerning the use of the uh, variac on the melt temp. It's important to understand that the setting on the variac is going to determine the maximum temperature, as well as the time it takes to get to that maximum temperature in the aluminum block so that we're going to set the variac at a proper rise in temperature versus the amount of time we feel is necessary to get a good melting point of the solid. And that's something that you're going to have to get used to and incorporate into your laboratory procedure. <laughs> Now, what you saw, and then go back, and I don't think you need to uh, see the, I heard the music or whatever that was. Uh, but anyways, you looked in there, you'd see first a little liquid inside. You look at the thermometer. At ECC, we use the thermocouple, so we actually have a nice digital readout. And then when it was all liquid, you'd write the second temperature. And that's what you'll be doing. Now, a couple of things. One because you're doing a range, if you put too much in there, like a mountain in that capillary, that's going to cause problems. And you don't want to, you want to keep it at a minimum. And let's look at today's lab. Here's a procedure if you were in the lab. And then you'd be doing, if we we're in the lab, a series of melting points. And you'd use biphenyl, benzoic acid, urea, and transcinamic acid, plus a 50-50 mixture. Unfortunately, we're not in the lab, but if you were, the first two are just to give you experience. Now, since you've not done, I think in my lifetime, I've done over a thousand melting points uh, for my PhD thesis. I had probably more than a thousand. I had about 150 new compounds, I think 125 for solids. And to report my thesis, each one, when it was ultra pure, I took the melting point 
three times to be safe. Uh, a lot of work, but it was worth it. But anyways, these usually when you're new, your melting points are a little lower and wider, not much, than the literature value. Now, if you notice, urea and transdynamic acid have the same melting point. And then I did them 50-50 mixture. And when you would do it live in the lab, you'd see it, notice it's a colligative effect. They're different compounds, even though they have the same melting point and the melting point is lower and wider. Now, the fun part of this lab, if we had, I have an unknown, A. And you would do the melting point. And then from the table here, A is one of these compounds. And you'd look at which compound is it closest to. Generally, your melting point is going to be about the same. And then in real life, you'd say, well, if it's 118 to 120, which one is the closest on this chart? Then you'd pick that, mix it. And here I did two of them. And if you pick the right one, you should get approximately the same range. If you pick the wrong one, you're not going to get the same range. Now, I'm not going to give it away. And you're going to have to figure out which one is A. It's one of these two. And you write it down here. Now, I have questions at the end, which you should do. And that's the lab report. And that's what you hand in. And I'm done for today. And with that, like I said, on Monday and Wednesdays, we'll be getting out earlier. But this will be the same face-to-face -face time you'd have if we were in ECC campus. With that, I'm going to say, gang gesund. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now. And I'll stick around if anybody has any questions. Don't forget, if you need help, I have my office hour tonight from 6 to 7.15 on Zoom with a different login. Bye now.